We hope that our uh, AZM committee roundtable discussions were, were fruitful. I know we had one on membership issues. I want to thank Marilyn Wind, our AZM uh, vice president for interorganizational relations, uh, who handles uh, membership uh, for, for guiding our discussions this morning. I saw that Alan uh, Silberman was guiding a discussion on the Constitution. Um, we thank you very much. Um, uh, I don't know which other ones took place uh, because we were, we were tied up here. Um, a few logistical matters. We're in this room all morning until we conclude on time at 2.30 after lunch. The schedule is in the uh, biennial program, so I won't comment further on that. Uh, for those of you who were here last night, you were treated to um, warm remarks uh, from Rabbi Schneier, who I presume will be with us at some point today. I want to take special note, though, of the workshops that we had, the, the breakout sessions that we had yesterday, because we had outstanding people who came. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of them. I particularly want to um, focus on the World Zionist Organization Department for Diaspora Activities. I want to recognize uh, Yaniv uh, Nachmias, who's in the back, if you'll stand, please. Uh, Yaniv, uh, on behalf of Gusti, who's in Europe on a special program for the WZO DDA, as they like to call it, the Department of Diaspora uh, Activities. Um, they've had here uh, yesterday, last night, participating with us, uh, the, the head of their delegation, uh, Roe, who's based out in um, California, uh, Adi, who's based in the New York office, uh, and then also Lior, who's up in Canada. And they participated in two of the breakout sessions. Um, there was a debate among the committee, and I again want to thank the committee. I want to thank uh, Francine and Paul, as well as uh, Mindy and Jan for their hard work. There was a debate on the whole issue of um, uh, workshops, uh, breakout groups, etc., and the decision was made. There was so much to cover that if everything was, shall we say, frontal, as we've done in so many of our programs over the last two years, if everything was frontal, everybody sits there, they, you listen, there's not even time for questions, and then you move on to the next major speech. So this was an opportunity to really have quality time with breakout sessions. I understand at least two of them got a little controversial. On the one hand, I'm sorry about that. On the other hand, I'm not, because we are a table organization across the spectrum of Jewish life. And part of our commitment, as you heard last night, is to Aliyah. And we applauded uh, uh, Vernon and Bryna, who uh, are in the process of making Aliyah. And the other, the other pillar is uh, Ivrit. Um, not enough attention has been focused, we believe, in the past on Ivrit. The teaching, the study, and the full embodiment of Hebrew as the language of the Jewish people. One last comment. It relates to our young leadership development. Under the WZO rules, we are duty bound to see to it that young people are involved in all of our activities. We worked hard to have more young people involved this year than, than uh, in some of our previous programs, but we're not doing enough. And unless we build our young leadership, we will not have people at these tables thinking, participating, pushing us forward in the spirit of Zionism, not only around the world, but here in America. Let me invite our uh, executive director, Herbert Block, to now um, introduce and lead off the session on Chagiga Ivri. Um, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we will start with the Chagiga Ivri program and then have a brief comments about our, our, the youth development initiative to follow before we hear from um, Alon Ben Gurion. Um, I am uh, pleased to represent AZM on the board of the uh, of the Hebrew Language Council, the Council for uh, Hebrew Language and, and Culture in North America, and they uh, 
um, and they um, um, uh, they share an o the space in the office with us. Um, we have here uh, Dr. Esther Sirok, who is uh, needs no introduction and was introduced yesterday, who's the president of the council um, and the WCO representative in North America. Rabbi um, Andrew Ergas, also uh, no stranger to this room, as a former director of Artsa, who is the chairman of the council. Um, Rabbi David Gelselman, who also, I'm sure is also known to many of you, who is the president and CEO of the Steinhardt Foundation uh, for Jewish Life, which has been actively supporting uh, the, the, the council. Uh, this month, um, the, uh, the Hebrew Language Council, as you'll hear, has launched a Chagiga Ivrit, um, and I think it began uh, this weekend and figured that coinciding with uh, our assembly and given the importance of Hebrew language to all the Zionist organizations, we would start today with uh, a presentation from the council about um, how we all can work with them and together on promotion of the Hebrew language and uh, culture in America. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues. And you can either speak from there or here, and we have uh, uh, to continue what I started to say yesterday about the different conflicts and the different uh, streams and the different the differences, the ideological differences, I think we're talking uh, about the future and we're looking for some kind of a common ground that will unite all the Jewish people. And I strongly believe that the Hebrew language is the next thing. It is the one uh, language that takes us from the past and will take us through the present into the future and can amend a lot of the differences and can bridge a lot of the differences. So I, I am very privileged to be the president by my capacity at the WZO, the president of the, at the Hebrew Council. I strongly believe in the future of the uh, council. We're working hard to make it a strong council, a, a white council that will uh, have under one tenth a lot of the uh, organizations around uh, North America. Uh, what we'll do today is uh, try to have uh, three uh, different presentations that are also, in a way, at least to my understanding, is like the past, the present, and, and, and the future. We'll start with the WZO because the WZO, the Hebrew, has a history and it was the initiator of the council. Uh, we'll continue with Rabbi Ergas, who is the chairman as a, the, the, of the council, and he will talk about the council of today and, and, and uh, plans for the future. And we'll talk with um, uh, the presentation of uh, Rabbi uh, Gesselman, um, that is taking a lot of the initiatives into the future with a, with a big uh, strategic planning. And we all uh, good partners that are working together and trying to move the, uh, the Hebrew language uh, forward here. A um, few words about the WZO and the, the ideas of what brought us as the WZO to initiate uh, the council. Um, when, when Herzl, I have to go back to my prophet Herzl, I, I can't help it, but when Herzl really dreamed about how we, uh, the country, how the uh, Jewish people will look when they will become a real people, he was talking about a flag and a symbol and an emblem and, and, and he needed a language. We need a language that will be the language of our forefathers, uh, the language of the Bible, and uh, one of the big helpers that helped him to uh, to succeed was uh, Eliezer Ben Yehuda, um, who um, really made one statement that impresses me very much until today. And he said that the, um, the decisive moment of his life was when he saw that the two things without which the Jews could not become a nation are the land and the language. And uh, we do understand the land, now we have to understand the language and the role of the language in our future, in our young generation. As, as I said, if they're not related to maybe synagogues or other organizations, when they go to Israel, they relate to the Hebrew and the fact that the Hebrew is a light language. We need to connect to our sources. We need to get uh, in touch with, it, with other Jews around the world and that can be one of the common grounds that will have all the Jews working together. So personally, uh, Ben Yehuda really tried to terrorize his home and his son by forcing him to speak Hebrew. 
He really felt he needs to create a new Hebrew modern language. And he really developed and created new words that were not in the old uh, vocabulary of the Hebrew language, not from the Siddur and not from the sources. And um, there is a, a, an interesting story about how he came up with the word kovi, cauliflower, when two ladies are trying to get to buy something and she said, I need something and it's, it's not an onion, it's not this. Um, you can find it in one of the uh, Yom Atzma'ut uh, um, seders. And eventually he said, oh, you're talking about COVID, about cauliflower. So from that day, cauliflower is not COVID in Hebrew. That's the way he created a lot of the uh, Hebrew language uh, words. Today we have in Israel the Language Academy that decides what are the appropriate words to be uh, part of the uh, formal language. However, they uh, contemplate a lot about the slang, about the everyday life uh, words on the street. And there are a lot of words that were created on the street that were adopted and they understood that it's part of the language, especially the special language in the army where they have abbreviations and if somebody wasn't in the army and people talk with the abbreviations, they don't understand what they're talking about. So Hebrew is changing every day, adding more words. And um, for many, many years, when the Jewish Agency and the WZO were together as, as under one chairman, um, both organizations taught a lot of Hebrew. Morim Shichim worked for many, many years, Ulpanim, uh, Ulpan before Aliyah. So the Hebrew was part of the ongoing activities. There were uh, uh, curriculum that was developed at the uh, Jewish Agency. And, and for many years, they believed that sending teachers, until today, sending teacher, Hebrew teachers to the diaspora all over the world is one way of bringing not only the language, because we have more Hebrew language teachers in North America than Shifim. We have 140 Shifim, uh, and there are different estimates how many Hebrew teachers are in North America. Some people say 6,000, some people say 8,000. We don't have a real count, but it's a lot. A lot of Hebrew teachers around. But the, the Shifim are bringing also the culture and the connection between the culture, the language, and, and the land, and the, the place where, where Hebrew language is the number one language. Um, when WCO and Jewish Agency separated the uh, chairman, it was decided that WCO will continue to lead the Hebrew language around the world. And I remember at the GA, Bushi said something about the Hebrew, and he said it's very important, we'll try to keep going and encourage the Hebrew, it's, it's wonderful, but then you understood, you know, we have to talk about who needs what, but definitely everybody feels like uh, Hebrew is an important component of our Zionist, Israeli, Jewish identity uh, these days. Um, in, 19, in 2014, right, the council uh, was was established with my predecessor, Simcha Dr. Simcha Leibovich, that was here and initiated with, with different American organizations, with the Sinai Foundation, with Andrew and uh, Avichai, um, and, and other organizations, uh, the Hebrew at the Center, um, getting together and creating uh, a, a council. Today we have different organizations that are trying to uh, um, promote the Hebrew language here, and I won't talk about it, Andrew will talk about it. There are teachers in school, there are, um, lay people from different organizations that are interested, philanthropists. Uh, they are professors, there's a whole organization of professors of Hebrew language, teachers of Hebrew language. Um, and we are trying to see that the WZO will give them the, the best support possible to the local organizations as being their full partner in order to promote uh, Hebrew. Uh, and, and the Department of Education is uh, allocating, usually they are sending all the money to, to the council, but it's definitely part of their ongoing uh, uh, budget. Um, the idea is that WZO should start following the good example of North America to establish more councils for Hebrew language in other continents. And it's very important that there will be local organizations getting together and promoting Hebrew. Uh, one of the ideas um, for
for WZO hopefully to, to push forward is the fact that we need, and I was told here by different people, we need the formal support of the State of Israel, the Government of Israel, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of the support, the formal support. And one of the ideas that we came up um, with uh, Radit and some more uh, friends is that we probably will approach the president of the state of Israel to form the Hebrew Forum, the president Hebrew Forum. He should call for an international forum uh, to promote the Hebrew language and, and that can give the Hebrew and the diaspora relations uh, the formal and appropriate status. So th these are some of the things that we still have to do at the, uh, at the WZO. And um, uh, one of the plans for the end of the year is to hold an international congress for the Hebrew language in Jerusalem, maybe in December. Um, from, I think, 1959, there wasn't a world congress of Hebrew uh, happening. So it's time to renew it. And the, the chairman of the WZO declared that when he was here in uh, November. Um, so we know also when we talk about mother tongue, uh, when we say mother tongue, we say it's it's a language that is taught by the mother, or it's the, it's a language that the mother is talking, and then the first language that the child acquires is the one that he hears from his mother or his father, uh, definitely from from the family. Um, I, I want to mention a few words about um, the language as a cultural vehicle to transmit identity and culture and understand the context where the, the language is, is really um, taught. And I can, I can bring a few examples that I have here. Um, okay. I want to take, uh, for example, Hatikva. All of you know Hatikva, all of you sing Hatikva by heart. Uh, I just uh, uh, would like to see it as close reading what type of uh, a Jewish, it's a Jewish uh, uh, anthem the Jewish people chose. First of all, there was a debate, uh, there was another piece of liturgy that was supposed to be, was tended to be the national anthem. Anybody knows what was the other? It's all ideology. The other one was Shira Malo. Shira Malo, they were debating whether Shira Malo will be bringing us all back to Israel or, or to have the Hatikva. And the reason, the reason Shira Malo was not chosen was because there was too, too much God, too religious. The Zionist movement wanted to have a different approach to move away from diaspora concepts, so Hatikva was chosen. And look what we have in Hatikva. It is, it is showing what are the main values or ideas. We have eye, we have a heart. We, we really have all that sensitive and emotional parts of the body that are yearning for Israel. And I once had a curriculum that I prepared for schools and I compared the, the, the Jewish or the Israeli national anthem to the American national anthem, French, uh, Egypt, and other countries. They're all with fires and guns and, 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 and uh, bombs and, and blood. And look what the Jewish people uh, um, chose. So language is ideology, language is culture, language is sending messages. And it's important, very important, to keep to keep using the original language only because some people said that when you read something, a piece of literature uh, that is translated, it's like kissing a girl through a veil. It's very close to the original, but it's not really the real thing. So we don't want to kiss a girl through a veil. We want to really kiss the girl. And, and if we know Hebrew, we know how to connect to the different um, um, uh, texts. Um, the other, uh, the other piece that you all know is the prayer for the state of Israel. I will not get into details because because it's 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 long. But I can say all of you probably are saying the prayer for the state of Israel, but in different versions. Different synagogues are saying uh, reciting different versions of the prayer for the state of Israel. Each one of the prayers, each one of the versions has an ideology behind it. If we take out the uh, take our brothers and sisters back to Israel, it means that we want to stay here and 
I remember talking to the prayer uh, committee of the conservative movement. Yes, it's an it's ideological decision. And if we um, pray for, the, for all the people around the globe, we have an ideolo ideological statement to say. So you can see these texts as, as an example of the connection between culture, ideology, and, and the language. Um, the last piece, The last piece, um, which I, I will not get into details because we don't have time, is a poem by Yehuda Amichai, Tourists. And this is, um, the analysis is a, is a major criticism about the relationship between uh, diaspora Jews and, and Israelis. I was talking a little bit about it yesterday. This is a very, very strong statement. And he's talking about the tourists that are coming, um, they're coming to visit they're coming to visit Israel, and they visit us through the curtains of the hotel. Yeah. They go to visit our special dead. They come to visit from one grave to another. Um, he really has that kind of, of a criticism, and he said um, what he really wants is not that, that the people will come and just visit the historical sites, the dead stones. He said one day he was in the market, he was standing there and he saw a man with two uh, baskets of food. And he said, I would love to see the tourist guides. Instead of saying, you see this man, to his right there is the arch from the second temple. He said, no, take the arch and say, to the left of this arch, there is a man who is buying fruits and vegetables. He's living in Israel, he has life, he has ideas, he has uh, uh, brothers and sisters and families. I mean, the change between looking at just the, this, the land with the history and looking at the people. We really want to have the Hebrew language as a connection between us in Israel and the Jewish people around the world. And although it's, it's a very tough criticism, I think the idea of, of just visiting the history, uh, uh, vice versa, meeting people, is the major statement. So I want to leave you with that. that uh, WZO, and I personally, as a Hebrew teacher, I, I, I strongly believe in the language, I strongly believe in, in the literature and, and education. Uh, we should think about different ways that will connect us all together to Amicha. Thank you. This is um, the, the, just a presentation about WZO, and I want to turn to uh, Rabbi Andrew Ergas um, talking to, uh, first of all, Rabbi Ergas. If, if you don't mind telling us a few words, why Hebrew and why do you know Hebrew and how do you know such a good Hebrew? Mele, I was, I had no choice. I was born in Israel. So, uh, you, you started with, uh, with uh, you could have met uh, Eliezer and uh, how he was a, a terrible father, punishing his children with Hebrew. So I'm the father of uh, three sons, and I considered punishing them by naming my twins Shy and Alone, and my youngest Moron. But when with, <laughs> but, but, but when with, uh, with Perez, Nathan, and Ari, but um, it was very, very important to me, and has always really been important to me, that uh, not only uh, I and I hope my children live lives with meaning, but lives lives uh, really committed to the Jewish people and to our culture and to our land. And uh, on, a, on a slightly more serious note, today is March 11th. Um, on March 11th, 1943, the entire Jewish community of what is today Macedonia, which is where my grandparents are from, were gathered up by the Bulgarians. They were sent to the Monopole uh, tobacco factory in Skopje. And over the next two weeks, the entire community, with the exception of 151 people who worked in the medical field, were sent to Treblinka. And so today is a, a particularly a day that really does connect me to our people, to our past, um, but also to our rebirth. Uh, last summer, I brought a number of my family members, including my son, who had just gotten out of the army. We, we went back to the same little town. We brought a Sefer Torah, we did the very first Torah service on the Shabbat in 75 years. And to watch my three sons, who are all fluent Hebrew speakers, um, just bring back Jewish life in a place that has 
in a desert of Jewish culture was incredible. And that's the kind of thing that I'm pretty committed to, and I think everyone in this room is pretty committed to it. I recognize that uh, they were all really minorities. Um, I'm a Sephardi who uh, grew up in an Ashkenazi world. Um, I'm one of those uh, keep-a-wearing Israelis who votes on the left. I'm a uh, HUC-trained rabbi who happens to be a Dover Ivrit. Um, I find myself a Zionist in a community that has really forgot the power of what that word really means and the potential and power that's in that term. And I'm someone who feels that Hebrew is too important to leave it just to the Israelis. You said it's a mother tongue. In Hebrew, we call that Sfat M. I think Hebrew is Sfat Am. It's the language of our people. And as somebody who's now working on a doctrine at the Davidson School on sort of the relationship between pedagogy and identity and Hebrew, I think it's essential that in the same way a small group like us are trying to keep Zionism vibrant and dynamic and alive, that we also do the same thing with Hebrew. And we make certain that it is something that for literally two millennia connected the Jews no matter where they lived, allowed them to open up our past, but also to envision and dream a very distinct Jewish future, that Hebrew is something that we have some ownership of and some control of and some facility with. So, that's the uh, short answer about why Hebrew is important to me. A uh, Jewish answer. A um, little bit about the Hebrew, uh, the Council for a Hebrew Language and Culture in North America. Um, as uh, Dr. Sorok said, it was launched uh, in 2013. Uh, it actually, one of the key partners at its inception was the AZM, and uh, Ken Bob called me up and said, Andrew, the AZM needs need someone who uh, can be our representative on the council, and you check off three boxes. Um, you're coming from the day school world, you're a uh, liberal-oriented rabbi, and, uh, and you're young. So at, uh, in my late 40s, I guess I represented the, the new youth guard um, of the AZM. I, I see there's been tremendous uh, change since uh, six years ago. Um, and uh, we started out by, uh, by gathering in uh, really a destination uh, hotel in Newark, New Jersey, um, to kind of launch uh, this initiative um, to really try to make a difference in terms of the status and priority of Hebrew on the North American Jewish agenda. So let me see if I look at that. Um, our mission was, uh, was both broad but had with some uh, specific direction. And we would try to increase the prestige and the dissemination of Hebrew language in North America. We would encourage and deepen the learning of Hebrew language and its use. We would promote activities to disseminate the Hebrew culture in North America, like the Chagi Gaibri that we're a part of right now. And then support the development of resources for our various initiatives. Um, that was kind of conceptually what was happening. What was happening on the ground was really a gathering of everyone who is Mishugala Davar, all the people who are some combination of crazy about Hebrew and just crazy, to bring them together to begin to dream about what we might be able to do in a more collaborative and, and focused uh, basis. And those next couple of years really focused on kind of building out this council and building uh, an internal structure that would help us move forward. So the formation of the council uh, began by let's identify people from all streams of life, academics, educators, uh, philanthropists, uh, communal leaders, camp directors, activists. Let's bring them together and begin to think about what it might look like to have a more focused uh, um, effort to support Hebrew in uh, North America. We decided that we would gather um, on a regular basis, and since then we have had uh, six national conferences. Um, last year, uh, in December, we had 
400 people. Um, and it's uh, one of the interesting things. It's one of the few gatherings where, at least within the Hebrew Language Council, which is mostly made up of North Americans, we conduct our business in Hebrew. The fact that there's a Jewish organization that is conducting its business in Hebrew or Hebrish or English um, is really something, but it's important to us. It's not just uh, symbolically important, but it's making a, a very important statement. Um, we also began to think about how do we support this with staffing, and we started out with a, with a part-time coordinator and it's since grown to a full-time coordinator. We've also worked very closely with the WZO staff on various initiatives. We began to build out uh, web presence and that's expanding over the last couple of months as we've renewed our uh, website. And as we begin to reach out using all the different types of technologies that will bring this message uh, to the broader community. Um, while the first uh, year or two was really about just establishing ourselves, and we're now an independent 501c3, it allows us not only to have a specific uh, North American focus, it also allows us to um, receive uh, funding from the philanthropic uh, community. Um, we decided we would also focus on two programmatic initiatives initially, and we have now expanded that to a third. Um, one, it became very important to us that we support um, the teachers of Hebrew. As Esther said, it's not 100% clear how many teachers of Hebrew there are. There may be a couple thousand that are teaching in day schools. When you add other immersive uh, Hebrew environments, you add another thousand or more when you talk about supplementary education, um, when you talk about Hebrew at the university level, etc. There may be eight, maybe even 10,000 teachers of Hebrew. For two generations, there has been no professional association. Not only to help set standards, but understand that Hebrew is not just something that's symbolic. It's an actual real language. That we need people who really know how to teach this language. And that's been an important initiative. I'll go into a few more details in a second. Secondly, we wanted to create uh, around North America opportunities to celebrate both Hebrew and Hebrew culture, um, whether it was on the local or regional level, to create an opportunity for those people who cared about Hebrew, whether they were a growing population of expats from Israel or their children, who were very challenged, both in terms of their Jewish identity as well as the Hebrew skills, or those people who went abroad and learned Hebrew or invested in their day school experience or other situations to learn Hebrew. We wanted a place where they could go and celebrate. And then recently, now that we've established those, we're working on how we strengthen our advocacy agenda. So to go into a few of those in greater detail, the um, NAHET, the National Association of uh, Hebrew Teachers, or Irguna Morim, um, is a group that we, we brought together just about a dozen uh, teachers of Hebrew in our second uh, Hebrew Council Conference. We kind of gave them support and a facilitator, and they spent two days kind of envisioning what this would look like. And since then, they've slowly grown into um, an organization with plenty of challenges, in fact, that is, that's a major topic on our upcoming executive committee call, uh, to say that uh, it's somewhere between an organization and a disorganization, um, but there's tremendous passion to both elevate the status of Hebrew teachers, to elevate what it means to be a professional teacher of Hebrew, and also to recognize um, that in the grand scheme of things, um, most of our teachers of Hebrew their main qualification is that they're a Hebrew speaker. They may have no real training in education, they may have no advanced degree, and only a, hand, <coughs> a handful of them are actually trained in second language acquisition. And for some reason, our community has allowed this to be. For some reason, our parents in our day schools are demanding about mathematics, and they want to make certain that their kids can get into a great uh, soccer program or a great school, but are not really dedicating the time to ensure that after 
eight or nine or 13 years, they actually have real skills in this language that's so central to identity. So this is important work that they're doing. Our uh, conferences that happen on a national basis continue to grow in terms of numbers and stature. And now we've been moving out into the community. In fact, as we speak, there's a training going on in Atlanta at Prisma being run by our staff and, uh, and volunteer leadership of the Hebrew uh, uh, Association. The Chagi Gaivrit is also a program that is slowly growing, and I think this is in particular an area where we might be able to conceptualize a wonderful partnership between the Hebrew Council and the AZM, because most of your constituent organizations have regional and local leadership, have people who care deeply about Hebrew, but we have, we're right in the middle of what will be a wonderful celebration here in the New York area. In fact, uh, we'd love to invite you on the 24th. Um, and there's a little place called the 92nd Street Wine. We'll be having a, a festival of Hebrew choirs from a number of schools around the community, both day schools and charter schools. Uh, children will be uh, singing the songs of Art Einstein. There'll be an opportunity for them to both learn about this fundamental uh, creator of Hebrew culture um, and to be together and to celebrate uh, the singing of Hebrew, and we see these events happening in other parts of the country uh, as well, including uh, to the north of us in Toronto. And our new big thing is really to focus more of our energy on Hebrew advocacy. Um, how do we make certain that there is a central address that is maximizing the interest at the local, regional, and continental level to push the Hebrew agenda forward? So we're doing it through our work on the council and who we add to the council. We're doing a lot of work with people who are doing research um, and other publications on Hebrew to bring what we're learning about Hebrew to the communal agenda. We're establishing a Hebrew roundtable, which will be an opportunity for people to come together on an annual basis to think and to dream and to argue and then to take action to move this forward. Um, it's very important that we find places where we can elevate Hebrew, where, it's a, where, we're, east, where we're leveraging already existing uh, resources. And finally, I think collectively, we all want to make the case for Hebrew. We are quite cognizant that Americans have something about learning a second language. We're quite cognizant that most North American Jews, discounting the half a million or perhaps more uh, Israeli expats living in the country, when they think about their heritage language, they think about Yiddish. They don't think about Hebrew. And we know all the resources have not been aligned to move this forward. But collectively, we have to make the case for Hebrew so that it gets the time, attention, and resources. So, you know, we, uh, we're not certain that we can, we can make that case, but we hope you and AZM will be a part of that effort. We will continue to look for funders who care about this. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Rabbi Gelsman, who has been one of those individuals who has brought this, uh, this subject uh, to, the, to the funders' table to make certain they get some attention. We have to think about where is our leadership going to come from. In the same way that uh, Richard earlier said, Looking around the AZM room, how do we make certain that we have another generation of people? It's fundamental that we find a generation of people who care about Hebrew as well, and not just because they grew up speaking it as their spot M, but because they've made it their spot um. And then how do we work with our strategic partners? And once again, I want to reiterate, you were a part of this from the beginning. In the first two years before we had established ourselves as a 501c3, you were kind enough to serve as our accountant and our, uh, our banker. Um, now that we um, are standing on our own two feet, we will continue to look to you for partnership, for ideas, for energy, for vision, and ideally to help us make this uh, thing move forward. So at the end, we're going to have an opportunity for any uh, uh, reactions or questions. But with that, I want to turn it over to uh, my friend and colleague and rabbi. One question. 
um, oh. my privilege as a moderator. Uh, if you can add a few words about the training in Middlebury, that idea of school of Hebrew. Oh, that's perfect. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> great question, and uh, Rabbi Gentleman is going to talk about it. Good morning. Thank you for uh, for making this conversation an important piece of, of what EGM is uh, now moving forward to do. I, I will try. I will try. Um, that, thank you for making this conversation part of. Uh, David, could you stand up, please? We can't see back here. So Bill has his skill causing trouble. Good to know. Um, so I'm a president and CEO of the Steinmark Foundation for Jewish Life, uh, Michael Steinmark's Foundation. Um, Michael is someone who doesn't speak a word of Hebrew but deeply sees and understands the value of modern Israeli Hebrew um, to who the Jewish people is. And um, we see an important uh, value of bringing modern Israeli Hebrew language to American Jews as a focal point of identity because we understand that the vast majority of American Jews don't see themselves as religious people. Their understanding of their being Jewish is a familial thing, as a connection to people, hood, and um, we see Hebrew as one possibility to give rich content and experience to American Jews um, for a, a deep connection to, to Jewish civilization that doesn't necessarily come with theological um, obligations, that it doesn't necessarily come with the theological commitment. It's, it's about civilization and culture, and it's not just, it's, it's not only something that is an abstract referent to a body of text and understanding and concepts, but that when a person learns any foreign language and learns it correctly and acquires that language, then that language becomes part of who they are. So when, when someone internalizes the Hebrew language and makes it part of their insides, then they, they, they speak and understand the world around them, the people that they interact with in the terms of that language, and they experience the, the fabric and the tone of day-to-day -day life in Israel as part of who they are when they speak modern Israeli. And so we see it as something that has tremendous potential to give American Jews a focus of Jewish identity that, as I said before, is rich in content and powerful and in the moment and is a lived, vibrant um, reality. Uh, we've, because of this commitment to the Hebrew language, we, over the years, have been involved with a number of projects to bring Hebrew to America, mostly to, to young people. And, and of course, as both uh, Esther and, and, and Andrew mentioned, um, you know, we became an early supporter of the idea of, of the Hebrew Council. Um, starting in 2007, we started looking at the possibility of creating Hebrew language charter schools in North America. And um, we opened our first school in Brooklyn in 2009, Hebrew Language Academy Charter School. But as we were designing the model, we asked the question, well, what's the most effective way to teach Hebrew? So we looked at the whole day school world, and we looked at what people were doing, and we, we came to the conclusion that for the most part, Hebrew as a, as a living, modern language that, that kids could really speak and understand wasn't happening. But we found one person who had developed a methodology for the teaching of Hebrew. Professor Vardit Ringwald, then at, at Brandeis University, now at Middlebury College, who was an expert in second language acquisition and learning foreign languages, and had taken the gold standard for learning foreign languages, which is called the proficiency approach, and adapted it 
to Hebrew. And she did that first actually at Brandeis in the way that Hebrew was being taught to college students there. And then she did it with the development of an actual afternoon, an after school program in Cambridge called Kesher. And then together with Arnie Winchell, who was the founder of Hebrew at the Center, they, they founded the Jewish Community Day School in Boston, and they founded it with the methodology of the proficiency approach. And so we went up there to Boston to, to see how they were doing it, and, and, we, and, and these kids were really speaking Hebrew, and they gave us tours in Hebrew, and they, they felt comfortable in the land. They made a few mistakes here and there, but they felt really they were inside of the land. They weren't translating into English, and I could, you know, I could spend an hour talking about the various elements of the methodology, but, but it's really it's really about first of all, in this methodology, there's no translation. It's all about the way the language functions. And the teacher never ever speaks English and um, and has all kinds of pedagogical strategies for bringing the student into the language in a vibrant, with immediate way, and brings all kinds of authentic materials which happen to be Israeli cultural. Um, items and elements that, that become part of the instruction. Um, so we, we founded that first school, and we, we made the decision to incorporate this methodology into the teaching of Hebrew at HLA in Brooklyn. And now there are 13 schools, there's about to be 15 schools, there will be close to 5,000 kids in these schools in the next two years. They're all across the country. Um, there are a number of them in New York. All three of my children have attended Harlem Hebrew Language Academy Charter School um, in Harlem. Uh, and the other thing about it for us is that we believe that to make Hebrew relevant and real for American Jews, you have to make it relevant and real for Americans of all backgrounds. Because American Jews, for the most part, aren't, aren't living in, in a ghetto. They live, they're fully entrenched in all of this fully entrenched in the open society of America. And, and if, if, if Hebrew is interesting and authoritative and real for Americans in general, then it will be real for American Jews. But if it's not real for Americans in general, it won't be real for American Jews. That's just the, that's just the way we believe American Jewish identity is structured in the 21st century. So um, we're, we're deeply committed to finding all kinds of ways of, of bringing language to Americans and American Jews. Um, other programs we've created, uh, Hebrew at Camp, uh, this past summer, we are, we are, are programming in, um, in, in Jewish day camps across the country, full immersion, all day long, 180 hours over the course of the summer, we have over 500 kids in 13 sites. This summer, we'll have over 600 kids in 15 sites. And, and we're growing that program. And we work with, with the Sochnut, with Shlichim, um, and we train them in the methodology, and they're, you know, they're young, they're 20, 21 years old, some of them are right out of the army, and um, the relationships that, that develop between the kids of Shlichim in Hebrew rather than in the in, in the broken English that usually is the situation with the thing with kids in Hebrew um, is really powerful. Um, another thing about the methodology is that um, this methodology works by first beginning with oral proficiency. It, because, because the methodology mimics or reflects the natural way that a person learns a language. How do you learn a language? You hear it from your parents. And Esther mentioned probably more first from one's mother, but you hear it from your parents as, as a newborn, and you're not cognitively understanding. It's an emotional, an emotional valence of language, but it's, it's, it's your close connection to, the, to, to, to your parents, and you, you hear it, and you start to understand it, first emotionally, then cognitively. And we all, you know, we see our kids, how they, it takes, it takes a few years, right? Then we start to, to speak the language. Then when you're four or five years old, maybe you start reading the language. Then you start writing the language. So here, here's the, the thing that I found very powerful. The Jewish people 
preserved the Hebrew language for 2,000 years as a liturgical, religious, legal language, but not as a natural spoken language, because that was our reality in Aesop. Right? That's the story. As a central part of the Zionist movement, as becoming a people in its land, living naturally in the terms of its civilization, as Esther pointed out with Eliezer and Yehuda, bringing Hebrew back to the Jewish people as its lived, natural, real language was essential to the Zionist revolution. And, 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 it, and Hebrew became a natural language. Well, here's the problem. In the diaspora, the Jewish educational establishment never got the memo and continued to teach Hebrew first as a written language, letter recognition, the Sidur, and maybe would sprinkle on top of it understanding and speaking. But, ne but, but, but is, you know, the whole story of the olive and the honey and the three-year-old and the rest, that's about letters, that's starting with letters. That's not a natural language. So the interesting thing, thing to me is that in our Hebrew language charter schools, which is half Jewish, half non-Jewish, right, in our public schools, we're teaching Hebrew in a way that reflects the reality of Zionism, and in most American Jewish day schools, we're not. Right? So this methodology of teaching Hebrew, I see as a Zionist enterprise. It makes the Hebrew language real and natural. Middlebury College. So Vardit Ringvall, this professor at Brandeis, ended up moving over to Middlebury College, which is famous for languages, or really famous for languages. And we helped her found 11 years ago the School of Hebrew at Middlebury College. It's the fastest growing language school in Middlebury. And five years ago, our foundation funded a master's program for, to train teachers in this methodology of teaching Hebrew. And the most important element of, of really to move forward with the Hebrew language is to train teachers, to recruit people to be Hebrew teachers, but not just to be Hebrew teachers, to be Hebrew teachers who understand this way of teaching Hebrew. And we need, we need to train hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people for it to move forward. We want to be approaching local public school districts across America in areas that have large Jewish populations in the school districts and making Hebrew a foreign language option in middle school and high school. Because that's what the Jews are. We want to do that. We don't have teachers. We don't have teachers who are well-trained teachers that have certification as teachers in public schools. And, and who have the training to, 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 to do second language acquisition the correct way. So we are working together with Brandeis and Middlebury, our foundation right now, to create a consortium of universities across the United States that will offer both BAs and MAs in the teaching of Hebrew according to this methodology so that we can grow a whole new field of Hebrew teachers across North America. And um, for us, for us, the next chapter of the Zionist revolution is making Hebrew a reality, modern Israeli Hebrew a reality for North Americans, Jews and non-Jews alike, so that Hebrew will be a global language. A global language in a different way from the way French is a global language and English is a global language, but we want it to be a relevant global language that's vibrant and, and powerful because we believe that when people really grasp this language and make it part of who they are and feel its fabric and feel its rhythm and feel its tone, they deeply appreciate the vibrancy and the humanity of Israel. I visited charter schools and I saw black kids in first grade and Muslims and, and Arabs and all kinds speaking Hebrew and writing beautiful Hebrew. It was exciting. And I saw your son speaking fluent Hebrew in camp, <coughs> at Naya camp, and, and it is working. 
So that's exactly what we say, that we can make Hebrew a, a formal foreign language that is really accepted across the board. If there are any questions, or, um, yeah, or if you have any suggestions, something really, yes, please. Yes. Um, I have a question about existing um, informal classes. JCCs have groups of people come together weekly, bi-weekly. They'll, they'll learn Hebrew in their way. But they're sort of hanging loose. They're very informal. Is there any way that any of the organizations you are setting up um, can help them or be available to them as a resource? Um, or even for any of our Hadassah study groups, um, you're offering something fantastic, but it's out of the reach of most of us. And I'm wondering, is there anything currently? Yours is very academic, and you have a great plan, and it's working for your charter schools and children aim. But now that I found out that late 40s is young, it should be possible <laughs> <laughs> for some of us to get this. First, first of all, we do have Ulpanim, and um, I think uh, if Hadassah would like to have classes, we promise to find um, uh, different ways to find teachers and to find a way to learn uh, Hebrew. Uh, the other thing that we started to do, uh, also based on the, the whole experience of Birthright, and thanks uh, Michael Seinhardt for Birthright, which is amazing, amazing is to create centers in, in the United States. We started two pilots in New York where we have a, 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 a cluster of activities in Hebrew, movies and lectures and cooking in Hebrew and singing in Hebrew and discussing in Hebrew. So, so there will be a whole atmosphere for people who are looking for atmosphere of Hebrew. Um, yeah, just uh, two, two things uh, and, and uh, when I'm, when I'm not here, I'm actually the executive director of JCC, and uh, we're, I'm working with the JCC Association, thinking about how do we use that framework. Um, there's, on a weekly basis, a million and a half people walk through the doors of the JCC, two-thirds who are Jewish, one-third who are not. If that's not a fertile ground for this kind of conversation, I don't know what is. Um, one of the things that's really important to understand, though, and uh, David alluded to this, when he was talking about the day camp, um, real acquisition of a language takes time. It really takes time. And uh, I think we always have to really be thoughtful about um, you know, the, those programs that give people a little bit of a taste, but really never get them to a place where they feel successful, and where they've really acquired the language and have some control. Um, on the other hand, understanding that maybe not everyone has the ability to dedicate that kind of time. And we have had some interesting conversations at the uh, Hebrew Council about the growing uh, population who, you know, now that the average age is, uh, you know, 81, um, how are we making certain that those people who once again may have time on their hands can begin to develop uh, that language. But that's kind of the, on one hand, there's a, there's a cone going up. The further up the cone you go, the more you are able to acquire a language. But if you flip it upside down, there's also a pyramid. How do we expand the number of people who will care about Hebrew so that the tip who are able to really dedicate that time and who, like you, who are leaders in your community, are ensuring that there's resources that are being set aside to ensure that time, which is the ultimate resource, is going to help people really acquire this language. Uh, we got the signal that there's only time for one question, so maybe if the three questions get asked, and then we'll just answer it with one brilliant answer. Right, well, Mike, Mike, you said you formed the 501c3, and that's fantastic. And I'm wondering if uh, you are granting any money to new schools or existing schools to hire better trained teachers in Hebrew for their teachers. Your question? It was sort of on that line, particularly on what I'm concerned about, and I unfortunately came in late, is that the, uh, the synagogue schools, uh, more and more they're seeing less and less of a necessity to have many days. 
maybe many are down to one day a week of Hebrew school in general. And I know the conservative movement used to have two to three days, and I think they're down, and I reform, I used to teach kids. And how do we get back into the schools to get those parents interested enough to really give them the, the, the full Hebrew course as well as the Jewish studies course? And that, I think, is more addressed to many people here. So, the, oh, one last question, yeah, Asana. I, I was just interested in the extent to which you've done work on computer assisted uh, by project acquisition uh, for people who are not in formal uh, educational settings, so I, people like us. I mean, I'm a dropout of one of those programs. <laughs> combines all the questions and it has to do with how do we get the existing after school Hebrew schools to change their methodology in how they're teaching a language, not just to educate our kids to be able to follow the prayer book, but to actually be conversant with Hebrew. So I'll take the I'll take the first part of the first question and then hand it over I think to David who can speak with uh, with, with greater authority on some of the other parts. Um, as a 501c3, we're able to now receive money. Um, and the Andrew Ergus Family Foundation, with its tremendous deep pockets, um, has done what, it's, what it can to uh, help support uh, the Hebrew Council. But um, part of our role, as we see ourselves in the constellation of Jewish organizations, is to be out there being the advocate to ensure staffing, financial dollars, hours in the day of schools, hours in the day of priorities in supplementary education, hours in focus in informal settings, making certain that we're bringing all of those pieces together and to leverage them to ensure that Hebrew gets, it gets its, 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 its share of, of attention. But um, yeah, we're, we're, we're not yet distributing uh, significant sums um, other than to really try to subsidize the professionalization of teachers, bringing them to conferences, subsidizing, training, etc., because that is what that is the tip of the spear. Without the koach adam, without the personnel in the field who can do this and do this correctly, we're just going to be banging our, our heads against the wall. In terms of the other questions, let me turn it over back over to David. Yeah. So part-time Jewish education is a tremendous crisis. And I see a lot of reasons for it. And one of those reasons is has to do with the institutional ages, the, the institutional context of where kids go for, for religious school, Hebrew school, part-time Jewish education. And I think it goes to a serious problem with the synagogues. No kid is going to acquire the language in a real way one day a week. When, it, when it's, the real state of that time is taken up with other stuff. The only hope I see is that there are a number of new independent organizations that are offering aftercare on a daily basis. And they mix it up with Judaica and swimming and soccer and, 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 and the kids are, have the opportunity to be there five days a week. They may have the potential to offer you, but I think the JCCs really need to take this on. But the JCCs don't want to fight with the shuls. The, you know, I think the JCCs should take on the whole notion of part-time after-school Judaic education because they have their swimming pools and they have their arts studios and they have their their gymnastics, and they have their soccer, and they can mix it up in such a way. But the politics of it are, are very fraught. And the fight community, um, they're, they're afraid of it, for the most part. Um, but if we're going to make a change and bring to our kids what we need to bring to them, then people have to not be afraid of fight. Thank you very much for being here for inviting us. And, and my, my recommendation 
is besides what the professionals have to do, it's up to the parents and the families to encourage and to give the right message to their kids that Hebrew is important. Day schools are only 10% of the Jewish kids. So all the rest, it's up to you and us. So that's about it.